for yet another episode in the ongoing saga of making glass from the art of fire. I'm going to start the day off by making a traditional pitcher in a transparent aqua color and the pipe is up and heated. I'll go get the color and we'll start this process. Perhaps some of you have seen the pictures being made. We have a couple of different pictures. This one is the traditional shape picture with the spout and the handle. And glad you're with us. Enjoy your visit. Nice to Thank you. Let's go. All right. Well, good morning. We're hoping that uh, our video stream is working out all right today. We've got a a different camera and a slightly different setup, so we're hoping that everything comes through just fine. Foster's over at the annealer now, picking up the small piece of aqua color that he's going to use for this picture. It's pre-Joanna. So, it's preheated to about 900 degrees. It's on the end of his blowing iron, and he's going to finish heating it up over here in his glory hole. The glory hole is simply a reheating unit. There's no glass in it. It's a ceramic chamber that'll accept temperatures up to about 2300 degrees Fahrenheit. This allows the glass blower to reheat the glass while he's in the making process. Once the glass cools a few inch, it gets a little bit trickier. Good morning, Bridget. Welcome aboard. So once you got to reheat it, and that's the purpose of the glory hole, is the reheating chamber. So Foster's going to melt that aqua color in, and then what he'll do is come on over here to the metal table, the marver. He'll shape the glass on that, and then we'll watch him trap some air in the blowpipe, and then after he does that, we'll see the bubble expand into the color. So it just takes just a few moments for him to get that reheated to the points that it's melted. It'll appear orange when he brings it over. There it is on the end of the blowpipe, and now he'll roll that on the marver back and forth. He'll shape it to a conical shape, tap the end. This cools the glass a little bit and keeps it from expanding too rapidly. He blew into the blow piece and you can see it's no longer conical. It's now bulged out kind of like a thumb. That's our indication that it's got an air bubble inside and that'll be the interior of the vessel. Now that's not a real big chunk of colored glass right there, but we don't need a lot for this picture. And if that were the sum total of the glass, this would be a little thumb-like picture. But by constantly adding more glass to it, we'll be able to create the full-sized picture. Here's a sample of one over here. We used that, well, it's kind of hidden behind a couple glasses. So with the amount of color he has on the end of the blowing iron, he'll be able to make a picture that size and the color will run throughout. He's ready now to go take the first. Our furnace holds about 450 pounds of molten glass. And it's clear, because if we had an aqua furnace, we'd be making aqua glass and nobody could get pink or blue or red. Well, thank you, Bridget, it's nice to be back. Okay, so that's why we have the aqua color there first. And now, good morning, Liz, and welcome. Glad you, to have you from Germantown. Foster will now shape the glass with the wooden block. Wood would do. It has a nice tight grain. That cup is shaped while the uh, wood is green before it's had a chance to dry out. And then after we get it from the maker, we keep them in water the entire time. You can see a little steam rising from it right now. It chills the outer surface of the glass and it also helps to shape it. Having a nice uniform shape, there he is blown into it again, and we can see the bubble has expanded inside the covering of clear glass. So he'll build up the volume gradually. His first gather, we can take a look at the size of the parazon it's called. The gather of glass right there fits very nicely into that block. On his next gather, he'll pick up even more glass, clear glass, to surround that, but just like they did on Jaws, he's going to need a larger block. He's going over to the pipe cooler right now. It's a trough of water, and that helps cool the end of the iron a little bit. The irons don't get super hot except for about the first foot or so coming up from the glass. 
but the advantage of cooling the pipe is it allows the glass blower to reach further down toward the glass to actually hold the iron. That is better leverage and a lot better control of the glass. Foster's got his second gather and when he brings this over you'll be able to see that it's got a much greater volume than what he had before. So he's got more glass, it's generating more heat, he's going to get a slightly different block. Again, that chills the glass on the outside a little bit, gives it some stability, but it gives it that nice rounded kind of Q-tip shape on the end. He's using the jacks right now to simply shape it a little bit. Notice he's tapering the glass toward the bottom of the piece. And he's also cutting what we call a jack line or a neckline into it. By squeezing those metal blades just where the glass comes off the pipe, he's created a place to remove it from the pipe later on. It's going to blow a little more and we'll watch that color core expand some. And now for a reheat. So that's the about, uh, about the amount of working time the glass blower has after coming out of the furnace. Maybe a minute or so, then it's back for a reheat. His next step on this picture will be to put it down into what we call an optic mold, or a dip mold it's sometimes called. We dip the glass down in there, the glass blower blows really hard, and the glass expands into the ridges of that mold, and there you see the ridges, right there. Good morning, Antoinette. Welcome aboard. Glad to have you with us. That's a design element, the ridges are, and that's why we call it an optic mold. It gives optic impressions to the glass. Now Foster's going to roll a piece on the marver, but you'll notice he just rolled the very end of it, the tip. That was to cool it so that when he blows now, it does not inflate excessively at the bottom. He wants to keep a large amount of glass down in the bottom, a reservoir if you will, because he's going to make this much, much longer and he's going to want to blow it out. And if the bottom got too thin, the piece wouldn't stay together. Most all of our pieces, well good morning Steve Ellis from England, glad to have you with us. Okay, so uh, what he's going to do now is heat that up considerably and then he's going to begin to elongate it. Almost all of our pieces are made by starting with a sphere and a neckline or jack line in it. And from there we move on. So now by using a little bit of gravity and a swing, notice he's not over exuberant there at first. He just takes his time, lets the glass move gently and elongate and then once he's let it cool off a little bit more, he might get a little more adventuresome with it. Now comes the part of turning the iron, keeping the glass centered or straight on the pipe, and inflating the bottom. So that's why he needed that reservoir of thick, clear glass at the bottom, because he knew that he would be enlarging that portion of the piece. Most of our pieces are made by forming the bottom half to two-thirds of a vessel first and then switching to another iron, we call that the transfer, and then we finish the top. So he's got the body of this almost done except for one important element. If he were to transfer this to the punny and finish the piece now, it would roll off the table He's when you, when you bought it. So now what he's got to do is shape the bottom and flatten it. And that will make sure that it doesn't roll off of anybody's kitchen table. So he'll use a small paddle, flatten the bottom. Good morning from Tommy's Workshop. Hello there, and Peter, thank you. Okay, so now that he's got that flattened, he puts a little indentation in the bottom to receive the punty. Josh is going to take the piece from him and do what we call flashing. The flash heat is just a momentary introduction of heat just to keep the glass well above a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Otherwise, it would crack. So Josh will keep his eye on Foster and what Foster's doing down there. And he'll also keep an eye on the piece to make sure he doesn't tag the door. Foster's going to make the putty. It's just a little bit of glass on the end of the pipe. 
that little bit of glass will act like a bit of glue, if you will, and it will stick to the bottom of the pitcher. Foster will align it and make sure that it's aligned with the central axis of the piece. We call this centering the piece. So if he starts turning that putty iron, watch the iron. If it moves up and down a lot, it means it's not centered. He uses the file to straighten it, a little scoring and some water, and then a gentle tap, and it'll break off at that weak spot. And there it comes free. And there's another successful transfer. That's usually the breath-holding moment for glass blowers, if you will. It's simply because at that point, if the putty is and the neck are equally weak, it becomes a floor model. So a little explanations do there, I guess. Uh, glass will break at its weakest point. If the neckline that Foster created is the same weakness as the punty attachment, they'll both let go at the same time when the glass vibrates. So we want to make sure that the punty attachment is strong and that the neck is weak. And when we combine those two things together, the piece goes directly onto the punty iron for finishing. And you can see when he comes back out that he's got this beautifully shaped pitcher for the lower two-thirds, maybe even three-quarters of it. You'll also notice that he's heated mostly the upper reaches of the piece. That's the orange glow in there. He's going to use a pair of shears and trim the glass to give himself a nice even lip on the vessel and also to get rid of a little extra thick glass out there. He'll use the jack blades for some gentle shaping and then he'll come back for more heats. And you can kind of gauge when he's going to go back for heat by looking at the color of the glass. So he con will continue to work on the top portion of the vessel. Every once in a while he'll flash the whole piece just to make sure it stays warm. If that putty gets cold, it will let go. So he's going to drive the heat into the upper reaches of the vessel. And when he comes back to work on it, keep an eye on the color of the neck. As the neck gets darker, as it loses that orange hue, it'll be getting colder, it would be harder to work, and he'll need to go back for a reheat. By swinging it like that, he elongates it just a little bit. So keep an eye on the color, and let's watch him work with the jacks. Right now what he's doing is opening the diameter of the throat of this, but look at the color darken. The color is darkening where the metal blades are touching the glass. They suck the heat right out of it. So he's been back here probably, what, 20, maybe 30 seconds. And he's got that worked and we're coming back to the aqua color, so it's time for a reheat. So with all this jumping up and down, you wouldn't think there'd be any such thing as a fat glass blower, but I'm not gonna reverse the camera right now. But it does happen. Okay, so he's gonna get that lip flared out a little bit more, and then they'll go through the process of forming the spout. But right now he needs to open it up just a little more. You'll notice he had the back half of the vessel kind of outside of the glory hole. That's because he didn't want it getting so hot that it would melt. You can see the brightness up in the lip and the throat area. He's got a special pair of uh, jack blades there that are actually made with a Teflon material. The glass slides on them and it doesn't steal much heat at all. Once he gets this shape to where he wants, he and Josh will work together to put the spout in. The way this will work is Foster will have a carbon bar. He just moved that onto his bench. Josh will take a pair of jacks in a moment, and Foster will place the carbon bar on the lip of the vessel, and Josh will squeeze the jack blades around that carbon bar, and that's what will give us a nice throw. <laughs> Thank you, Bridget. I appreciate that. <laughs> So here he goes with the carbon bar, Josh squeezes around it, he'll give Foster the jacks, he'll round that back out a little bit, do any final shaping, and we've got the beautiful spout. Okay, there we go. 
So now what we're ready for is a handle. So once again, Josh will flash the piece. This will keep the uh, heat in it, like I said, to over a thousand degrees. He'll do that a couple times and we'll keep an eye on Foster as he gathers. Foster will take two gathers over there. And Josh has got his eye on what's going on down there so we, he knows when to time the flashes. When it comes time to place the handle, Josh will bring the piece to the bench. Foster will bring his fresh hot glass to the marver to shape it. As soon as Foster goes behind Josh, Josh will head over to the bench. Foster's going to roll this gently, but not too much on the marver because he doesn't want all the heat stolen from it. Josh has the piece waiting at the bench, and he will point the spout straight down. Foster attaches it and draws it up a little bit. As soon as he snips it, Josh will turn the piece 180 degrees, let the handle hang straight down. Foster's going to clip it just a little bit, exposing some fresh hot glass, and with his tweezers, attach the handle to the body. He'll use that same carbon bar now to stretch the glass upward and make full contact with the body, and then with a sweeping motion back and forth, give it that elegant handle for your hand to fit in. So if you're really interested, is this an order, Foster? Okay, if you want this one, get in touch with us. It can be yours. Artofire.com, 301-253-6642. So now it'll be just another flash or two here, and then what he'll do is give the handle its final shaping, and it'll be time to take it off of the punty iron. Now, just like we wanted the neck to be weak before, we want the punty to be weak now. We want that to be the point of separation. So Foster will take a small butter knife and tap around the punty joint, and the heat that he's putting into that right now keeps the body warm so that it doesn't get cold and crack. Right now he'll take the butter knife, tap around the putty joint, not to knock it off because it would obviously fall on the floor, but rather to weaken it so that when he hits it with the hammer handle, it will fall into his gloved hand. Josh holds it up a little bit, there's the tap, and it comes right off. Way to go, nice work. That's a beautiful picture, Foster. So there you have it. Now the longest part of the glass blowing process, the annealing. This is going to go into the annealer. Well, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, what, what, what up? Yeah, that was a one off. The one off, okay. The one off. So anyway, yeah. uh, the annealing is typically the longest part of the process, and that lasts for about eight hours. It relieves the stress from the glass. So if we get one that didn't come out quite like we wanted, well, we just make another one. And that's part of it. So, well, thank you, Foster and oh, thank Josh. Thank you very much. Great work, guys. All righty. So if you'd like to join us for some more glass blowing, if you're watching, well, you should be watching live right now because this isn't available for replay yet. That was kind of a dumb statement. So if you want to join us in 10 minutes on Facebook Live, the Art of Fire channel, we'll be doing about a two-hour demonstration of pieces and having a lot more fun there. So thanks for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.